Um, so, so you all know Lion King, right? The, the great infinite, infamous story. Uh, yeah, yes sir. Uh, has everyone seen it? Show of hands, show of hands. I don't want to have to re-explain the whole story. Wow, there are people who haven't seen Lion King. That, that's hard to believe. Yeah, like Grant. Anyway, so in the story, um, we have uh, this one scene where Mufasa and his brother Scar are at the top of a cliff. Y'all remember this? You know where I'm going with this? So, so Mufasa's hanging off, hanging on for dear, dear life, you know? Um, we got the king hanging on and his brother Scar who has the opportunity to help him back up, but instead he decides to betray the king and let go. What does he say? Nobody remembers. Long well, let the king. All right, anyway. Um, and he lets go. He betrays the king. And uh, Mufasa falls to his death. Um, and simil similarly, um, in the passage that we're going through to today, which is Hosea 1 through 3, um, we see a picture of how, how Israel did this to God, how they betrayed God, how um, they looked to other pleasures instead of God. Um, they were betraying God by practicing worship of other gods. Um, and Hosea gives us a picture of this with a really cool metaphor along with it in the story of Hosea. Um, so if you want to turn there, today we're going to hop into the first chapter. We're reading three chapters. Um, they're not that long, so don't really worry. It's not going to take forever. But I'll try to read them um, quickly and as well as I can. So we're going to see here that God is the faithful king who chooses to love a faithless people. Um, so chapter 1 here. Mike's in my way. I'm going to have to hold the Bible. So, uh, all right. So chapter 1. If you're all there, I'm going to go ahead and start reading it. Um, so chapter 1. The word of the Lord came to Hosea, the son of Bere, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, the kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the, word, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take yourself a wife of whoredom, and have children of whoredom, for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. For he went and, so he went and took Gomer, son of Debilam, and she conceived and bore him a son. And the Lord said to him, Call his name Jezreel, for in just a little while I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. And on that day I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. She conceived again and bore a daughter. And the Lord said to him, Call her name No Mercy, for I will no more have mercy on the house of Israel to forgive them at all. But I will have mercy on the house of Judah, and I will save them by the Lord their God, and I will save them by the bow, not by the bow, or by the sword, or by the, war, excuse me, by the war, or by the horse, or the horseman. When she, when she had weaned no mercy, she conceived and bore a son, and the Lord said, Call his name not my people, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be like the sands of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And the, place, and the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, it shall be said to them, Children of the living God. And, children, and the children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together, and they shall appoint for themselves one head, and they shall go up from the land, um, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. So we see here, first section, um, God commands something very strange. Um, of his prophet Hosea. He commands him to marry a wife um, who will commit adultery against him. So the, just think about this. He's a prophet of God, and God tells him directly, go marry a woman who will cheat on him. This seems a little weird, doesn't it? Not just a little weird, a lot of weird. <laughs> because it's, it is a prophet of God, and he's telling them, or him, to go do something that a prophet wouldn't really have much respect. There wouldn't be much respect for the prophet if he went and married this kind of woman. Um, but Hosea does it anyway. He's faithful to God. We don't see him question it, which I think is really important. Um, but yeah, Hosea marries Gomer in this situation. Um, it seems a little strange, but with this in mind, I want to point out, uh, first of all, why would God ever do this? 
This is very strange. Um, like I said, Isaiah was a prophet. Uh, but we see in this passage, or uh, in future, the verse, or chapter 2 and 3, how God had a purpose for this command. And that this would end up being a picture of Israel and God. Um, so first up, I may have already said first up, second up, um, we're going to set up the characters. We got Hosea, okay? So Hosea, the meaning of the name Hosea is salvation, um, which is fitting because Hosea, in this metaphor, is a picture of God. Um, and then we have Gomer. She represents Israel in this uh, metaphor. She also represents us. Um, first, or We have the first kid whose name is Jezreel, which the meaning of Jezreel is um, God will scatter. So this is likely a prediction of um, the Babylonian captivity, which hasn't happened yet in the history of Israel. Um, but this is a picture of judgment on Israel, that he will scatter them abroad. Um, and then we got the two other kids. Um, in the Hebrew, and some translations of our Bibles have it as Lo Ruhema or Lo Emi. I don't know if anybody has that in their Bible. I found it in one of them. You got it? Yeah, he's got it. So what does that mean? Great question, Kimsey. That means literally what I read, not my people and no mercy. Um, so God demands that these names be given to the offspring of Gomer because God will no longer show mercy to Israel. He's no longer extending his favor to Israel. And this is a sort of rejection of Israel for, um, for in this point in history, they, they took up worship of, of other gods. Um, namely, Baal. Um, so, a little backstory on Baal worship, just in case you're wondering. Um, Baal was a god of the Canaanites. So, uh, Israel coexisted with Canaan uh, for a little while, which led to intermarrying and adoption of their practices and their god rituals. You know, I'm sorry if I'm getting back from the mic. But, um, so, this led to practice of uh, worshiping other gods. And a large part of corporate worship of Baal was prostitution. So you can kind of see how this ties into our story here um, about idolatry and unfaithfulness. Um, so the name Not My People symbolizes God rejecting Israel because they had broken their covenant with God. This was a sort of divorce, if you, if you will, of God and Israel. And that's what we see here. Um, so the, we obviously don't do this, right? We don't worship Baal. We don't bow down to idols. I hope. Um, but this isn't some sin that we struggle with nowadays. Am I right? I'm not right. Trick question. Um, so in James 4.4, 4, we see um, that actually we are still adulterous against God. It says in James 4.4, 4, You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. An enemy of God. Um, so for Israel, um, they became friends with the Canaanites, and they conformed to the, the worship of the Canaanites and the worship of their gods. So for us, we still commit adultery against God today when we conform to the world, when we choose sins um, over God. So conformity to the world for Israel may have looked like Baal worship, but for us, this could be anything from gossip, any form of sexual sin, um, taking the Lord's name in vain, hating others. You can probably fill in the blank with whatever came to your head when I said that. Um, whatever the world normalizes that God rejects is conformity to the world. Um, yeah, sin is a big deal for a Christian. I'm sure you already knew that, but I just want to push that all the more. Sin is committing adultery against God. It's like having an affair. It's like if you were married and you and that person cheated on you, that is exactly what our sin is to a holy God. Um, it's personal. We know that. God is a person. He, he takes offense to it. It's against him directly and his um, law. And one theologian put it like this, it is cosmic treason against a holy God. This is very serious stuff. Um, I, hope, I hope I can express that as much as I can from this text. Uh, how serious sin is. But in part two, we're going to see that God calls for repentance. So this uh, part two, 
Um, it's going to be chapter 2, 1 through 14. Um, this is God's call for repentance from Israel. Um, this also applies to uh, Gomer and Hosea's story as well, but it's, this part of the text is mainly focused on um, God and their, his relationship with Israel. So I'm going to go ahead and read um, what do we got here. Verses 1 through 14. And it goes like this. Say to your brothers, you are my people, and your sisters, you have received mercy. Plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife, and I am not her husband. That she put away her whoring from her face, and her idolatry from between her breasts, lest I strip her naked, and make her like the day she was born, and make her like the wilderness, and make her like a parched land, and kill her with thirst. Upon her children also I will have no mercy, because they are children of whoredom. For their mother has played the whore. She who, can, who, she who conceived them has acted shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers who give me my bread and my water and my wool and my flax and my oil and my drink. Therefore I will hedge her up, hedge up her way with thorns, and I will build a wall against her so that she cannot find her path. She shall pursue her lovers, but she shall not overtake them. And she shall seek, she shall seek them, but not find them. And then she shall say, I will go and return to my first husband, for it was better for me then than it is now. That sounds a little bit like the prodigal son there, doesn't it? And she, she did not know that it was I who gave her the grain, the wine, the oil, the, and who lavished on her silver and gold, which they used for bail. Therefore I will take back my grain in its time, and my wine in its season, and I will take away my wool and my flax, which were to cover her nakedness. Now I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and, and no one shall rescue her out of my hand. And I will put an end to all her, mir her mirth, her feasts, her new moons, her sabbaths, and all her appointed feasts. Those were all um, forms of Baal worship as well. And I will lay waste to her vines and her fig trees, of which she said, These are my wages, which my lovers have given to me. For I, make a, for I make them a forest, and the beasts of the field shall devour them. And I will punish her for her feast days of the bales, when she burned when she burned offerings to them and adorned herself with rings and jewelry, and I went and went after her lovers and forgot me, declares the Lord. So God is calling for repentance of Israel. Um, the thing in this passage that's very shocking to me happens in verse five uh, b, um, and then continues through verse eight. But before we get to that, I want to point out. Uh, the beginning part of this passage and kind of explain what it means. Because it is a little bit confusing to follow this metaphor, but um, God is calling the children of Israel to call out to their faith, unfaithful friends and their unfaithful family members who are committing these adulterous acts against God. He's giving them a second chance, which um, they didn't deserve. <laughs> and we don't deserve either. But God was still giving them a chance to change, to repent and to return to him. And people say that the God of the Old Testament is evil and mean, and the God of the New Testament is the gracious one. But here we see a clear picture of grace, that he didn't owe them this second chance, yet he gave it to them um, freely. Uh, now in verse 5b, it says, for, sh for she said, I will go after my lovers, who gave me my bread and my water, who gave me oops, my wool and my flax and my oil and my drink. Um, so Israel was going after these Baal gods because they felt that it was what was satisfying them, what was, um, what's the word, uh, profitable. They thought that going after Baal was profiting them in some form or fashion. So they went after them. But we see in verse 8 um, what the true, why they were actually receiving these, these gifts. In verse 8 it says, She did not know that it was I who gave her the grain, the wine, the oil, and the one who lavished on her silver and gold, which they used for Baal. So we see here that God was still graciously giving them gifts and still giving himself for the rebellious people here. Um, this is huge. God still provides for them, even though they're rebelling directly against him. Um, but of course... Uh, they would not go unpunished from this because God is just. But we see um, in future texts that he does redeem them uh, from their 
uh, idolatry against him. Um, so sin might look satisfactory to us. Um, it might look like that's where the world gets its profit and its gain, but for a Christian, it is not true satisfaction. For anyone, it's not true satisfaction. It will leave you wanting more, which goes against the definition of satisfaction. Um, some ideas from Scripture of what satisfaction actually means. I have three uh, verses here, real short. Um, first one is Isaiah 58, 11. Um, it says, And the Lord will guide you continually and, and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong, and you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. So satisfaction is unconfined and it doesn't fail. It is enough. That's what that shows us. In Psalm 107, verse 9, he says, For, uh, for he satisfies the longing soul, and the hungry soul is filled with good things. So this is like um, Thanksgiving Day when you wait hours and hours to eat. You're starving. You need that food. You need that turkey, that stuffing, all that goody good. And, uh, goody <laughs> good. Sorry, I threw myself off. Um, and you finally come to 3 o'clock when all the food is prepared. And you stuff yourself. And you, you take all the food you want, all the food you need. And you are satisfied. You're content. That's what that shows us. Um, and then finally, in uh, John 6, 35, Jesus speaking here says, um, And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. You see, God is the satisfaction for the Christian. Um, and true, lasting satisfaction comes from Christ. Um, so sinning for a Christian is going against God's law and going against God himself. It's like a dog returning to its vomit. I'm sorry to be a little graphic. But in Proverbs 26, it literally says that. Um, it's like a dog going to its vomit to eat that instead of, analogy, uh, a hot, fresh, um, crunchy, delicious Crunchwrap Supreme being offered to them for free. It's like the dog going to the vomit over the, the free food that's being offered. Um, obviously, this doesn't make any sense. That, that why would why would they choose the that over the, the fresh contrast supreme, which is not the best thing to talk about, but that's another story. Um, uh, sorry, I keep backing away from the mic. Um, there's something not right about this. Sin is unnatural to what God off is unnatural and not what God offers us. But we see what God does offer us when we do go back to that moment. Sorry. Um, in part three here, we see God offers us restoration. So this is the restoration of the covenant relationships, is what we see. Oh, okay. Sorry, that lost. In, uh, verse, in verses 14 through the end of chapter 2, and in chapter 3, we see the restoration of the covenant relationships, namely um, God and Israel and Hosea and Gomer. Um, so I'm going to read the rest of chapter 2 here, and we'll talk about this. So the rest of chapter 2 is 14 to the end of the chapter. It says, Therefore, behold, I will lure her and bring her into the wilderness, and speak to her tenderly, speak tenderly to her. And, I, and there I will give her her vineyards, and make the valley of Achor a door of hope. And there she shall answer in the days of her youth, and the time in which she came out of the land of Egypt. And in that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband, and no longer will you call me my Baal. For I will remove my name. I will remove the names of the Baals from your mouth, and they shall be re remembered by name no more. And I will make for them a covenant on that day with the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens and the creeping things on the ground. And I will abolish the bow and the sword and war from the land. And I will make you lie down safely. And I will go, and I will betroth you to me forever. And I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice and in steadfast love and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. And in that day I, I will answer, declares the Lord. I will answer the heavens, and I shall answer the earth. And the earth shall answer the grain, the wine, the oil, and they shall answer Jezreel. And I will sow for her myself, for myself in the land. And I will have mercy on no mercy. And I will say to not my people, you are my people. 
and he shall say, you are my God. So these, these verses here, in the end of chapter 2, scream of the loyal love that God has for his chosen people. He made a covenant with them, and he keeps his covenants. We see um, restoration, like I said, of the covenant relationships. Um, and this is just a beautiful picture, but to get back to the metaphor of Hosea and Gomer is uh, here in chapter 3. Um, it's a very short chapter. It's only five verses. Um, but it packs such a punch. It's, it really hits home, at least for me it did. And uh, this will wrap up Hosea and Gomer's story in the book of Hosea. Um, so let me go ahead and read that, and we'll see how it relates. So chapter 3 says, And the Lord said to me, talking to Hosea, Go again, love another woman who has loved another man and is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel. Though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins. Now Hosea is speaking of um, the rest of his story, what he did in, uh, in return. It says in verse 2, So I bought her for fifteen shekels of silver and a homer and a leche of barley. And I said to her, You must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore or belong to another man, so will I also be to you. For the children of Israel shall dwell many days without a king or prince, without, satis without sacrifice or pillar, without ephod or, house or household gods. After the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they shall come to fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. Um, a commentator said, said it like this, Hosea's prophetic word flowed from out of the life of his family. Hosea's relationship with his harlot wife Gomer typifies Yahweh's covenant tie with Israel. Basically, it's a, it's a mirror image of God um, and Israel. That's what Hosea and Gomer here are. Um, we see here God stays faithful even when we are faithless. I think that's an important takeaway. And then in verse 4 and 5, he um, talks about being exiled, which uh, is predicting the Babylonian captivity where um, Israel will have no king, it says, uh, and they will be scattered, just like the name Jezreel that we talked about earlier meant. Um, <clears throat> however, he does promise that this is not the end for Israel, but in the very last verse there we see, he says that they will once again seek God, they will once again fear God, and once again be redeemed by God in latter days. So, what does this mean to us? How does this apply to us as believers, or even as non-believers? How does this story relate to us? I hope, throughout me telling it, that you saw pictures of the gospel um, in this story. I think it's pretty, it's pretty obvious to some extent. But, um, but anyway, from a perspective of the gospel, uh, we see that we who are Christians, are Gomer in this story. That we once, at some point, entered into a marital relationship with Christ at salvation. We at some point were unfaithful, committing egregious acts of sin and, and um, adultery, spiritual adultery against God. Um, and that we deserve nothing more than to be not his people and to receive no mercy. Um, through all of that, Christ bought us back. Um, in Hosea, he says, so I bought her back for 15 shekels of silver and other stuff. But for God, it was not 15 shekels of silver that bought us back. It was the blood of Christ that brought us back. The blood of our bridegroom. Um, but for the unbeliever tonight, you are Gomer as well. Only Christ hasn't bought you back. And that, that really does sadden my heart. I just said that and it kind of sunk there for a second. But if you're in this room and you're not a believer, you're in your idolatry against God and you are not one with God. But that can change because as we saw, God is gracious. Um, he's just along with being gracious and he will forgive you if you call upon him. He's faithful and just to forgive. Um, so Basically, I'm saying to believers, be broken by God's love. I mean, this, should, this story should, should hit at home for us, that we were dead in our idolatry. 
yet God would still be faithful to the ones who are unfaithful to him in return. Um, so we must be like faith. We should be faithful and not be like Gomer. We should see Gomer and reject that life. We should turn away from that life because that is not who we are anymore. We see that God is a faithful king who chose to love a faithless people. Um, but in conclusion, today, tonight, whatever it's called, um, I want to read a verse from 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. This is the New Testament. Uh, I'm sure you knew that. It's Peter. Uh, but I think this, this passage in Peter relates perfectly to this story here. Um, let me go ahead and read it. And he's speaking directly to us. So it says in verse 9, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you might declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Here it is. Here's the kicker, ladies and gentlemen. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Wow. So this is the gospel, according to Hosea. Um, that we were deep in our harlotry, obsessed with ourselves, with our pleasures, with our lovers. Um, we were obsessed with that, and we, we lived in that. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love which he loved us, even while we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. That's all I got. Let's pray. Um, Father, I just praise you for your word, God. Um, I thank you 